Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and start our webinar. Uh, this webinar is entitled The Business of Climate Solutions. And today, one of the things that we're going to talk about is sustainability and sustainability in particular in business. And we have a number of experts, really innovators, that are joining us today from the business community, small business owners included. We're also going to talk about a chance for you to become involved and to learn more about climate solutions, including sustainability, at our coming training in Miami. That's coming up next month. We'll go to the next slide and you can see that we have a pretty packed agenda here in our webinar today. Um, again, like I mentioned, we have a number of folks joining us, real, really leaders in the field of sustainability. And looking at that agenda, the next slide, you can see that we're going to start out by talking about generally what are we talking about when we, we mention sustainability in terms of, of solutions and, and business. Before I do that, before we talk uh, to our panelists and to our climate leaders, I'll give you a little background on the Climate Reality Project. Uh, we were founded and we're currently chaired by US, former US Vice President Al Gore. And the whole reason that we uh, exist really is to forge solutions for the climate crisis. And one way we do that is through training climate leaders all around the world. We train leaders to go out into their communities and to talk about the impacts of the climate crisis and also to demand solutions because we have those solutions available to us today. Something else that we do, we, we use really grassroots communications uh, that, that would include social media, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, other channels to really, to really get out there with our message. We also do in-depth in policy analysis and support, and of course, we, we conduct global campaigns. So let's get right to it and give you a look at the panelists we have with us today and our agenda. Um, you know, embracing sustainability, what does that mean? You know, what are businesses doing and why are they doing it? Uh, we're going to talk to some social entrepreneurs today who are really taking the lead in terms of sustainability and, and climate change solutions. And if you want to make a difference, you have the opportunity. And one way to do that is through the Climate Reality Leadership Corps. Uh, we have a training coming up in Miami next month. We typically hold anywhere between three and five trainings across the world every year. So you have more opportunities coming up next year. We're also going to talk about sustainability as an everyday practice. And we're going to do that through the lens of a climate reality leader in business. We have two of them actually joining us today. And again, we're going to talk about how you can become a climate reality leader. And we hope to, at the end of this webinar, take some questions from you. So if you have a question, be sure to click on the Q&A box and we'll try to answer those questions. So our first panelist joining us today is Brian McGannon. Uh, he is the Director of Policy and Engagement at the American Sustainable Business Council. Uh, Brian is going to talk about what the ASBC does, uh, the business field in general, why should, we why should we embrace sustainability, and what businesses are doing and initiatives of the ASBC. Brian, welcome. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, and uh, it's great to be a part of this uh, group of great panelists. Um, it's great to be back. I was uh, worked for the Alliance for Climate Protection, the, the earlier iteration of the Climate Reality Project, um, a number of years back. Um, so I, it's fantastic that the work is, is moving forward, um, and so it's just a, it's a real pleasure to be part of this conversation today. Uh, I'm Brian McGannon. I'm the Policy Director with the American Sustainable Business Council. ASBC is an organization with the mission to su uh, support in public policy that creates a sustainable economy. So in our view of the world, it's, it's more than just energy environment, but there's a lot of other pieces of the puzzle that contribute to what a sustainable economy is. Certainly, energy environment and climate is a real core piece of that. Um, we have two types of uh, members in our organization. There's business organizations, and you can move to the next slide. Uh, business organizations that uh, have their own membership. Uh, and then we also have individual business members. It's a lot of brands that you would 
uh, normally associate with sustainability. And through those two uh, groups, we represent about 20, uh, 250,000 businesses across the country. Um, so, you know, sustainability is in our name, and a lot of the, you know, the folks that are part of our network uh, clearly uh, have sustainability as, as uh, kind of baked into their uh, existence. Um, but sustainability in the business community is becoming nearly ubiquitous, uh, uh, certainly within the climate context, and it's not surprising why. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So why are, why are businesses embracing sustainability? ASCC conducted uh, national scientific polling of small business owners. Um, uh, uh, it, and this is not ASCC members, but this is nationwide uh, business owners. And 53% of the business owners uh, believe that climate change will adversely affect their business. So there's a real concern uh, that they will be personally uh, affected. And one in five of those uh, say that uh, because of extreme weather events, they have already felt the impact on their operations. So that's a pretty, uh, you know, alarming number. Um, and you look at the size of the polls, about 500 business owners, about 50% of them self-identified as Republicans, 35% said they were Democrats, and the other 15% didn't identify. Uh, so you see that this is, this is not a... Uh, kind of dispel the myth that this is a partisan issue. These are business owners who are, you know, really committed to just being successful, getting, uh, you know, being, through, uh, you know, getting down to work. They're not concerned about kind of whether this is a progressive issue or conservative issue. They they see that there's something real to their uh, bottom line. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So is how do, you know so how is this uh, you know how is this happening to them what what form it takes supply chain uh, and transportation disruption especially with extreme weather events uh, is a, a huge example uh, one of our member companies had three years in a row one was uh, the floods in Vermont uh, the next year uh, was Sandy and the third year uh, was a typhoon in Southeast Asia where one of their key ingredients came from. Uh, each of those years took a hit to their bottom line because of extreme weather. Increasing healthcare costs are hitting the business sector. Uh, stress on the power grid, some of, especially with manufacturers, that's an incredibly important piece of their business. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, recovery uh, from an extreme weather event is not an option. It's estimated that 25% of small or medium-sized businesses never reopen after a significant weather event. If you look at Hurricane Sandy, a lot of, you know, if you're a single uh, operation business, uh, you don't have the capacity to move your operation to another one of your other facilities, you know, you are wiped out. Obviously, the insurance will, you know, buttress your work, but it, it's, uh, it really hits small and medium-sized businesses uh, extremely hard. So we'll move to the next slide. Uh, it's not all downsides to the business community. Uh, there's a great opportunity, and I think what you'll hear from all the other business folks on the call today is that there is tremendous opportunity in taking on the, the, the climate crisis uh, and driving a new economy that's based on uh, a clean energy future. Um, innovation uh, is clearly uh, a core of that. Reducing carbon pollution is driving innovation in new uh, technologies for energy, um, whether it's re also renewable chemistry is a, a huge field that we're working in uh, that has uh, moving away from uh, petrochemicals into plant-based chemicals has a huge reduction in carbon pollution. Innovation, fast, uh, clean energy is growing jobs faster than the fossil fuel industry. It's just it's wide open for us. As a business, efficiency, cost reductions from having sustainable practices built into your business, uh, it's, just, it's, it's common sense. You're reducing uh, costs, you're reducing waste in your operation. Uh, it, it's good for your bottom line. And then it's also reduced risk from externalities. So you are you know, mitigating 
uh, any rifts, any price shocks to your system if you are driving towards a sustainable uh, business um, uh, practices uh, throughout. Um, next slide. And so what are businesses doing? Um, they are building in sustainability as a core value. Um, a lot of our members uh, had that baked in originally. These are you know, high road employers who see this as either part of their brand or part of their responsibility as a business owner. But traditional and kind of uh, long, uh, you know, older companies, more institutional companies are now adopting these practices too because they see huge benefits. They see consumers asking for and demanding products that are made in a more responsible way uh, and companies that are behaving in a more responsible way. Um, some of those practices are simple things like carbon footprinting for their operations. Some companies are pricing carbon internally, which is, I think, a very vital step forward when they are making their projections of, uh, you know, expansion and growth. They are factoring in a price on carbon, uh, which at some point we, at least ACC thinks we will get to a price on carbon uh, that, um, that will really reflect the externalized cost of pollution and that will be a, a driving force of reducing carbon pollution. And of course, engaging in public policy. So businesses increasingly are raising their voice uh, and speaking up and, and talking about not only the risks, but also the virtues of, of moving away from uh, a, a carbon economy. Um, and so that leads me to what AFPC does um, and how we are engaging businesses. We are doing a number of campaigns uh, where we engage our members to affect policy. So we are very active on supporting the administration's clean power plan. Um, we have uh, done a number of uh, uh, roundtable meetings. We have a number, a set of meetings set regionally uh, for September to explain the plan, how it works uh, to the region, how businesses can help uh, talk to governors about implementing uh, successful plans in, those district, in their states. Um, we have a carbon tax campaign where we are proposing a uh, why it would be viable to have a carbon, national carbon tax to help drive uh, uh, to a, a lower carbon uh, pollution economy and all the benefits that come with that. We advocate for eliminating tax loopholes and handouts for fossil people. So at the beginning when I talked about what a sustainable economy uh, means to us, it involves tax policy, it involves chemical reform policy, agriculture policy, all these different pieces. So certainly in the tax arena, uh, we need to stop subsidizing uh, bad actors. Um, and then we also need to support incentives for the future. So it's just good fiscal policy that you don't, uh, you don't give money to mature industries. Uh, it's smarter to give uh, government uh, support for uh, emerging industries that are higher growth, uh, job producing, uh, and kind of future, um, kind of the future of the economy. Um, so those are just a few of our actions that we're doing. Uh, I'll encourage you to go to our website, www.ascouncil.org, um, and feel free to contact me with any questions. Great. Thank, Thank you. you, Brian. Our next panelist is Jamie Knack. Jamie is the president of Three Squares, Inc. Uh, Jamie is going to be talking about the changing policy landscape, uh, practical challenges, and steps to sustainability. Welcome, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Climate Reality Team for having me on today. What I wanted to do is tell you a little bit about my story and also um, take you through, through our journey, both of Three Squares, Inc. and how we recently developed a second company specifically based off of a need that we saw in the industry and also um, realizing the support that was coming about from the federal government, particularly in the space of, of supporting sustainability in, in business and government operations. So a little bit about my story. I, we founded Three Squares Inc. back in 2008, 
And we are an environmental consulting firm headquartered here in Santa Monica, California, but we do work across the globe. And we specialize in implementing sustainability plans for organizations, so for corporations, um, large and small, so big companies like Adobe, HP, and Edison, um, all the way down to small businesses. And we also work with cities and government agencies, and we work with nonprofit organizations and college campuses. So we're known for our work in, in implementing complex sustainability plans. We also are known for implementing is sustainability for events, so for large-scale events, um, both here in the U.S. and then also abroad. And we, I would say our, our, our business has definitely um, sat at the intersection of policy and enterprise or business. And being based and headquartered here in California has been a benefit for us because on the policy side, California uh, really set the, the pace for the rest of the, the U.S. to follow with our Assembly Bill 32, which both helped spur city governments um, and government agencies based in the state forward from green building to um, clean energy and renewable portfolio standards, sourcing um, and education and beyond. But it also helped set the pace and encourage the business community within California to, to step up to the plate. And so that's why you've seen a lot of advances here on the clean tech side with electric vehicle technology, battery technology, renewables, et cetera, coming out of the state of California. Uh, we also have seen a, an increasing demand over the last uh, five years from both clients and um, governments from abroad. So we've worked in, um, in South America. We've worked in the last 12 months in, in India, Australia, South Africa, Argentina. And we've really seen that this, you know, this is not just the U.S. taking notice. This is something where both businesses and cities and government agencies across the globe are really realizing the, the um, benefits from implementing strategies that both reduce their environmental impact um, and also help engage and educate, whether it's their residents, their employees, their students on campus, et cetera. Um, two years ago, what we, what we focused on was how can we help really affect a behavior change around sustainability and implementing sustainable practices within the workplace so that then these, these same folks can take that knowledge home and it can spread across their communities as well. And so we set out to create a second company uh, called One Drop Interactive, which really focuses on behavior change through educating employees um, around energy, water, recycling, transportation, and a lot of these core sustainability topics. And what we found is, you know, we saw that there was a need from our clients for this type of educate, environmental education. But what we were really surprised about was that the federal government was actually um, thinking the same thing. And in earlier this year, in March, President Obama issued an executive order. It's called Executive Order 13. 693 and the, the the webinar team will go ahead and, and shoot out a link in the chat window so that you can all click and read more about this executive order but from a federal government perspective the white house really really set the pace here by by issuing this order which called for a 40 percent reduction goal across federal activities so the executive order is titled entitled planning for federal sustainability in the next decade and the, the main pillars of the strategy outlined in the executive order are increasing federal energy efficiency. So it really demands that federal agencies will ensure that 25% of their total energy consumption is from clean energy sources by the year 2025. It also calls for increasing clean and renewable energy use across the board for federal buildings. So 2.5% per year between 2015 and 2025. On the transport transportation side, it calls for improving efficiency in all of our federal vehicle fleets. So reducing the per mile GHG emissions from federal fleets by 30% from 2014 levels by 2025. So this would increase the percentage of zero emission and plug-in hybrid vehicles in federal fleets because the only way to really get to that pretty aggressive emissions target is for the federal government to start incorporating a higher percentage and purchasing both zero emissions, so, so electric vehicle and plug-in hybrid or plug-in electric vehicles for the federal fleets. 
and then reducing water consumption. So reducing water intensity in federal buildings by 2% per year through 2025. So all of these core areas will allow the federal government to reduce their overall GHG emissions 40% from the 2008 levels. This will also, this is where the, the, the ROI comes in as well, this will also save taxpayers up to $18 billion in avoided energy costs. So this executive order, the, the four pillars that I mentioned seem very overarching and very big picture ideas, but how does that relate to someone like a, a, an entrepreneur like me who just developed this tech company focused on employee education and environmental and engagement on environmental issues? Well, the one interesting thing about this executive order is it also, in order to accomplish all of these things, it calls for every federal agency to name a chief sustainability officer to oversee the efforts within that agency. So they want to make sure that the agencies from defense to transportation to energy, et cetera, all have one person and a team that's responsible for implementing this really ambitious plan. One of the, the items that that person, that, that that agency chief sustainability officer is in charge of it is environmental education for federal employees within their agency. So this, this is great for us because it allows us to now look at the federal government at a, as a potential client for our OneDrop interactive platform. It also just was a great, um, great reassurance for us that we're, we're building a product where there is a need not only to educate and engage employees in the private sector on environmental education, but the, but the public sector leading with, with the federal government, which is one of the, the largest employers with two, over 2 million employees, um, is, is really leading the charge and seeing that there is a need to educate and engage employees in environmental issues. And so that was something that I wanted to mention here because I think it's really important that we realize that the more that we as individuals can impact and, and affect and show our policymakers that these are issues that are important to us, the changes on the policy side, both from the state, from the local, state, or federal level, can really help spur business. So they can help spur both uh, small businesses, they can help spur investment in clean technologies so that we can help prime the market and really help these technologies come to market. Um, and they can help help grow the space uh, in, in, the, in the clean tech environment. So I wanted to just call out that executive order and definitely encourage you all to, to take a look at it. And I think what I'll do is I'll pass it back over to Ryan as the moderator, but I'm happy to answer questions as well. Well, Jamie, certainly that is very encouraging. The the policy landscape is is changing, and and certainly um, sustainability is is sort of a top of mind issue now from from local, state to federal government and within businesses themselves. Um, our next panelist is actually going to talk about uh, what businesses are doing. Um, she is Deb Nelson. She's the executive director of the Social Venture Network. Specifically, Deb is going to talk about what their membership is doing to address climate change. Well, welcome, Deb. Thank you, Ryan. And thank you all for joining us today. Um, so I'm going to talk about three things, Social Venture Network, Divest, Invest, um, and then invite you to attend some events if you'd like to get more involved. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Social Venture Network was created in 1987. <coughs> and we are a peer-to-peer -peer community of mission-driven business leaders, <coughs> excuse me, impact investors and social entrepreneurs. And when SVN was founded 28 years ago, we came up with the very modest goal of transforming the way the world does business. Uh, we have over 600 members and tens of thousands of followers and partners all over the world. And our early members were the founders of companies like Ben & Jerry's, The Body Shop, Tom's of Maine, Seven Generations, Stonyfield, Dwala, Eileen Fisher, man, many of the sustainable brands that you're aware of. Um, and now we're also supporting the next generation of world-changing entrepreneurs, so founders of companies and organizations like Back to the Roots, Method, TerraCycle, and Green for All. <clears throat> and our organization was created, you know, both to transform the way the world does business, but also it was created to be a safe haven for entrepreneurs, impact investors, business leaders to come together, learn from each other, lean on one another, and find the best ways to leverage the power of business to solve social and environmental problems. Um, 
Now, it's almost hard to remember, but in the early days of Social Venture Network, nearly three decades ago, most business leaders and investors thought that our members were crazy because conventional wisdom at the time said the purpose of business is to generate profit. And of course, they meant generate short-term profit. And that was the end of the story. And so back then, the idea of serving all of your stakeholders, customers, employees, local communities, shareholders, and the environment, considering the environment as a stakeholder, um, that, that seemed very radical and, and to some a foolish business proposition. And thankfully, today, things are very different. The good news is that most people want and expect companies to be responsible, sustainable, humane organizations uh, that can consider the needs of all stakeholders and that are working to protect and restore the environment. And early pioneers like Gary Hirschberg, the founder of Stonyfield, and other SVN members and, and great innovative pioneers, they helped make that happen. And Gary Hirschberg's story is interesting because he started as a nonprofit leader that was very focused on environmental responsibility. And then when he looked around and saw the business was the most powerful institution in the world, he said, actually, I want to become an entrepreneur because I really want to change things in a massive way. And, um, you know, so he founded Stonyfield. The company grew. He leveraged his company, his products, his packaging, his platform as a business speaker uh, to raise awareness about environmental problems and also to offer solutions. Um, and many of our members have done the same. And some of the key lessons that we and our members have learned along the way is it's important to tell the truth, keep it simple, and spark action. So in telling the truth and being transparent, you know, you don't pretend that you're all-knowing and all-powerful. You just lay out the problem and what the solution is or what the solutions are. And you keep it simple. You know, when you're raising awareness of the problem, don't get too technical or too mired in the details. Make it simple for anyone to understand. And spark action. Make sure that you're clear about what the solution is. Make it easy for citizens to make a difference. And let them know that they vote with their dollars every day. And so we're now partnering with environmental pioneers all over the world, people like David Young of Green Monday, um, that's working in Asia to change the hearts and minds of people all over the world. And he's addressing issues of environmental sustainability and uh, global warming and food insecurity. But he's really uh, focusing on Asia first and then moving his work out to the rest of the world. Um, we work on three levels, you know, the individual level, helping our members to become better leaders, the organizational level, helping them to create more sustainable, responsible companies, and the systemic level, so collaborating to affect systemic change together. Uh, and one of the initiatives that I became very passionate about just a couple of years ago was the Divest Invest movement. And that movement is essentially divest your money, your money, get it out of the top 200 fossil fuel companies and invest it in climate solutions, broadly defined. And Divest Invest is now the fastest growing divest movement in history. So they've got institutional investors, students, activists, faith leaders, business leaders, social leaders. They're all starting to divest their money from fossil fuels and invest them in climate solutions. And this was one of the most innovative yet simple solutions that I saw to the very daunting, massive problem of climate change and global warming. And so what we decided to do is, for the first time ever, uh, Social Venture Network as an organization decided to get behind the Divest Invest movement. And so we're reaching out to institutional investors, citizens, business leaders, individuals, students, and asking them all to take the Divest Invest pledge, um, both because there's a moral and, and ethical imperative. You know, we've got to stop subsidizing the destruction of our own planet and, and our own people. And there's also a smart business reason to do this. We have found that fossil fuel reserves, two-thirds of fossil fuel reserves cannot be burned, and so fossil fuel assets are overvalued. And so if you want to make sure you're making a wise financial move as an investor, whether you're 
an individual investor of very modest means or you're an institutional investor, it also makes sense to Divest Invest. And so you can go to divestinvest.org, find out more about it. You can take the individual pledge. When you take the individual pledge, you don't have to Divest Invest right away. You have three years to do it. Um, but I do encourage you to spread the word about Divest Invest because it's something that we all can do to make a difference. And when the large institutional investors, when endowments and foundation leaders decide to divest and reinvest, um, it really will be game changing, not only in terms of um, raising awareness about what we need to do to address climate change, but also changing the game in terms of the financial conversation about what needs to happen to address climate change right now today. So I want to thank you for listening. If you'd like to get more involved, hear more about leveraging the power of business to address environmental and social problems, I encourage you to join us for our upcoming events in San Francisco and Baltimore and DC and New York. They're all on our website, which is svn.org, or you can Google us, Social Venture Network. Thanks so much for listening. Well, thank you, Deb. And thank, thank you to all of our panelists, Brian, Deb, and Jamie, that have mentioned all sorts of resources out there for, for those that are interested in sustainability and, and climate change solutions. You know, one of the biggest resources that we have here at the Climate Reality Project is our Climate Reality Leadership Corps. Uh, we conduct trains all across the world. We train leaders to go out into their community, to speak to their networks about the climate crisis, and to push for climate solutions together. And we're going to be joined now by Olena Horkajo, who is a manager within our Climate Reality Leadership Corps, and she can talk about that program. Hi, Olena. Hi, thanks so much, Ryan. Um, so hi, I'm Elena Hercaggio. I am the program manager for the Leadership Corps. Now, what is the Leadership Corps? It is a global network of, of over 8,000 climate activists from over 125 countries working to educate and empower communities worldwide to take action on climate change. The first step to becoming a climate reality leader is to apply to and be accepted to attend a special three-day training where you'll join a global network of leaders committed to solving the climate crisis. We hold on average about four trainings a year. So just this year, we posted trainings in New Delhi, in Cedar Rapids, in Toronto just a month ago. And next month, we, are, we will host our last training of 2015 in Miami. At the training, you'll hear from our Climate Reality Project Chairman Al Gore, as well as a group of world-class scientists, strategists, communicators, and technical specialists. You'll learn about the science of climate change and the direct cost of its impacts on communities around the world. Most importantly, you'll learn about the solutions that are available today and how activists like you are helping implement them. Next slide. So climate reality is empowering citizens to advocate for strong climate action through our leadership core. So they're out there in their communities working to spread the word and you know, reaching out to their communities of interest, from business leaders to faith communities to farmers and other constituencies really around the world for, to build momentum for historic agreement at COP21. And that's just the start. We have to change the politics of climate change by creating more climate activists. And we have to do that one person at a time, getting as many people involved and active in addressing climate change as possible. Every person's voice magnified together works. It's going to take joint action to do all of this, but we can do this by working together. Next slide. So to speak a bit more about what to expect at our upcoming training, uh, we will host our last training of 2015 in Miami from September 28th through 30th. It is free to attend. You simply have to apply and be accepted. And so each of our trainings have various themes in order to kind of speak to the regional impacts and solutions of the area. And so for Florida, we're definitely going to focus on impacts. We'll be focusing on resiliency and adaptation. We'll have a, a really great panel on solar and solar energy and solar energy potential. And then another theme of, of raising the Latino voice. We're really excited about our upcoming training. It's going to be a very packed three days, three full days of the agenda. 
but it's an incredible time to really gain the skills about storytelling, public speaking, media strategy, contemporary organizing, and really just learning the most current uh, science of climate change that is possible. And honestly, just as important as what you learn at these trainings is who you'll meet. At every training, you're joined by hundreds of other passionate people that are working to solve the climate crisis, allowing you to connect with a global network of committed activists. Next slide. So what does it mean to actually be a part of the leadership core? What's kind of expected of you as a climate reality leader? We do ask that you commit to completing at least 10 what we call acts of leadership in your first year. This could be anything from giving a presentation, writing a blog post, uh, writing a letter to the editor, to hosting an event. Um, we, as Climate Reality, will share the tools and resources to you, and you'll also be joining our online community to stay connected with the thousands of other climate leaders around the world to share best practices, to share ideas, and really to just join this incredible network of climate leaders that we have. If you're interested in joining us and becoming part of the Leadership Corps, you can learn more and apply at climaterealitytraining.org. We'll, um, we'll have that site up in just a second. Now you will actually get to hear from two of our amazing climate leaders, so I'll turn it back to Ryan to introduce them. Thanks. Elena, thank you. Yes, we were lucky enough to have two climate leaders, trained climate leaders, that are not only climate leaders, but they're also business owners. And sustainability and climate change is something they care very much about. And when they are operating their businesses, it's, it's top of mind for them. Uh, we're going to start with Simone Rothman. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Future Air. Simone, welcome. And we're hoping that you could tell us about your business and how you've considered sustainability in, in the formation and, and the operations of your business. Well, thank you. Um, it's great to be a part of this. And um, so my name is Simone Rothman and I, um, I uh, last year I founded a company. We're in a very early stage called Future Air. We are basically designing the next generation of smart indoor air products um, to improve energy efficiency first and foremost, but also comfort and indoor air quality. Um, you know, this really stems from the idea that air conditioning is a huge contributor to carbon uh, pollution, and uh, we, we really need to reduce significantly uh, the wasted cooling, and, um, and so we're going to do that. And uh, as far as sustainability goes, it's really an organizing principle, and I've been in the kind of corporate world most of my life, and it was always very frustrating for me not to be able to um, to integrate uh, sustainability uh, uh, holistically. So for future air, what it means, um, it's everything from exploring sustainable products, new materials. Um, we're working with a product that's made from mushrooms um, um, and it's and it's very strong and that's really exciting down to the real details. Um, like uh, what we use when we have lunch, no plastic cups or bottles. So, you know, little things like that, that really just, um, uh, that are pervasive culturally and, 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 and people, I think uh, it's, yeah. So that, and, and, and on, a, on, a, on a macro level, looking at manufacturing um, regionally, uh, so, so that, and, and even rebuilding American manufacturing. So, so it's it's the you know it's the whole spectrum. Well, Simone, you know obviously there are a lot of considerations when when you're looking to be a sustainable business, and not all of it is going to be easy for a startup business. Um, maybe you can tell us about sort of the challenges that you faced and how you've overcome those challenges. Well, I think. Uh, just the general challenge that I face that's so frustrating is a lack of consciousness, you know, and I think that that's changing slowly, but, um, but it's, it, it just, uh, it's surprising to me, frankly, given the urgency uh, of the matter. Um, I mean, even like, uh, like looking at local manufacturing, you know, I, I've met some 
people in leadership positions that look at me like I'm crazy when I tell them I want to manufacture locally. Like, oh, you know, well, well, everyone's manufacturing in China. So, but there's a mindset there. And even though that's really, it's almost irrelevant because frankly, manufacturing in China, in China is not the answer. I know a lot about manufacturing in China and the rules have changed there also. And from a carbon emissions point of view, shipping things, big things, uh, we're talking about industrial production, is so wasteful and and it, it's so not sustainable. So, uh, so that's you know that's a challenge even at, at leadership levels. So we're we're really trying to use. Um, I'm trying to use my organization organization to 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 lead and create a new model um, for, for manufacturing. Well, we, we talked earlier about you being a trained climate reality leader. You know, how how did the training and the post training really inform or, or shape your business? Okay, well, I don't want to sell. I don't want to sound too much like a, a sales a sales <laughs> rep for climate reality, but I'm telling you, oh, go it, ahead. It, it has. It's it's been huge. I mean, it's. Uh, you know, I, 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 I randomly found out about climate reality and, um, and as soon as I heard about it, I said, I have to go because I really have to, I have to walk the, I have to, you know, walk the talk and, 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 um, and, and so I was really surprised that, um, I think and I, you know, I met an incredible network of people there that I'm still in touch with that have really helped, um, that have really helped me connect to other people um, in, in, you know, that, that are more conscious about sustainability. And, um, and, uh, and, and really it's, uh, it, it really ended up being far more important than I had expected because I went a little bit on a whim and I came away with a real, really a different perspective about how to approach, um, you know, how to approach this, integrating sustainability into my organization. Well, and, and you trained this year in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, or earlier this spring. And I, you know, we would be interested in hearing what sort of, you know, what sort of skills or, or useful knowledge did you take away from that training? Well, uh, a few different ones. I mean, I really went to to be able to articulate um, better what uh, uh, what what the reality of uh, the situation and the urgency of the matter, and and what I came away with is uh, there. You know, there was like a there was part of, part of it was a training on speaking, public speaking. And, and that was a, a small part of it, but it was really, really important because I think we need to be very clear uh, about how we communicate um, the issues. And so that was one of the things I, I took away from it. And really, uh, I made some amazing friends um, and some people that have been very supportive in the process uh, from, from everything uh, uh, from uh, working together on climate reality talks, organizing them together to, to resources. Uh, I met an amazing um, construction, uh, a, a contractor who's working on Passive House, which is a really interesting, which is very directly related to what I'm doing. So there, were, there was a cross section of, of things I've, I've taken away, away from it. That's, that's fantastic. You know, we have such a wide range, very diverse set of, of folks that come to these trainings and, and you're just exposed to so much when you, when you attend one. I'd like to hear a little bit more about what you see as, you know, we're talking about business and sustainability and, and climate change and, and solving the climate change, uh, the climate crisis. What do you see as the role of business in climate, climate action? Well, um, you know, I, I, I kind of got started on this topic by, um, by seeing uh, uh, um, a CEO, the, for, the CEO of um, Interface, Ray Anderson. I don't, I'm sure you've heard of him, but he was really one of the original businessmen that took on the, um, the, uh, 
the goal of being more sustainable and, and even uh, net zero. And, and in fact, I, I just went back and rewatched recently a TED talk on the business logic of sustainability that he gave. He's not the most magnificent speaker, but he <laughs> is an, a magnificent man. And what he has accomplished is, uh, you know, was stellar. And that was in 2009. So, uh, you know, I think what, what I took away and, and what inspired me about, about climate reality is that, is that there is there is a direct link between understanding it and then integrating it into, into, um, into the business values, into everything that, that, uh, that you do to build the business. So, so, you know, that was, I think, I, I think that that was a, a reminder of the fact that you can build a business and not have sustainability be a, an added cost, but really have it be, uh, uh, the baseline for um, uh, for for how you run your business and and profitability. Simone, thank you. Uh, I'm going to bring Jason Uckard into the conversation now. Jason is the founder of the Spotted Door. Jason, welcome. I'm hoping you can tell That's us about your business. That certainly is a, an interesting name for a business, and and how you how you incorporate sustainability into your business. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So, um, uh, hello everybody. I'm Jason Utgard. I founded a uh, website called The Spotted Door. It's this, uh, thespotteddoor.com, and um, we are an online retailer that's uh, dedicated exclusively to products made from recycled content. And so, uh, the the goal of the site is to basically show consumers that anything um, you need in your everyday life can be made from recycled content, and becoming uh, kind of a one-stop shop for um, you know, uh, all sorts of different categories from clothing and jewelry to furniture and what have you. So um, it's kind of the one thing that um, uh, uh, got me first looking at, um, at, at starting this was I, I grew up in my family's uh, chain of retail stores. We had about 70 uh, sporting goods stores across the country, um, big, 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 big box stores of 60,000 square feet. And, you know, when you're at the kind of the, the focal point of a big, a retail operation like that, um, you do realize that uh, you know there's there's massive impacts of our kind of unconscious consumption, as, as I refer to it, and then also a one-way supply chain. And um, you know, as I started looking into it um, at a very very basic uh, level, we we send about 16,000 pounds per second uh, to landfills in this country, and that's um, not including construction waste or uh, commercial waste and and those materials are, are, of course, valuable and functional, um, and if anything, recyclable. And if we captured those, you know, it, it would definitely um, help us prevent pollution, um, it would save energy, uh, preserve our natural resources. It, it creates nine times as many jobs um, in the recycling industry versus landfilling. And so, um, in general, that was kind of my, um, my, my background and what led me up to uh, founding the Spotted Door. Well, you know, Jason, like like Simone mentioned, there there are definitely challenges whenever you're starting a new business, and in particular, maybe when you're trying to have a sustainable business. I guess, what sort of challenges have you faced, and how were you able to overcome those challenges? Yeah, definitely. So, um, I, I would say, and this kind of applies to um, you know being a climate um, uh, climate reality leader in, in general, but. The, the one thing that I, I, I've realized over the last few years here is that the, the one thing is everyone has to understand that they, as an individual, are an environmentalist. And that, that's not a bad thing. It's, you know, it's, it, you are an environmentalist because you breathe air and you drink water and you eat food. And, and just by our very nature, we are environmentalists. And if you understand that those are probably the most important things in your life, then you'll look at everything else through a different lens. And so um, when creating a social or envir environmentally focused business, there's a huge educational component that's much greater um, than, say, if you were just going to open a bar. Because, you know, if you told me you're going to open a bar, I'd probably say, cool, where is it? Um, but if you're going to tell me that you're developing a line of clothing made from coffee grounds, I'd probably say, are you what? You know, are you serious? You know, how, how does that work? Does it smell? Does it last in the wash? Can I give you my coffee grounds in my house? You know, there's this whole 
uh, you know, slew of questions that you get because what you're doing is not um, what's been, of course, probably done historically or some or a technology that uh, folks are familiar with. And so um, that learning curve and educational component uh, is probably what you can expect to be about where you spend half of your time on. And Simone would probably agree with me on that is that you 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 understand what you're trying to do and and what you're offering, but there's a huge educational component to that. And so um, to overcome that, it's really, uh, you know, we, we've had to, you know, being just based online, we do a lot of in-person speaking engagements. We uh, support a lot of um, uh, events by local environmental nonprofits to go out there and, and you know, speak with more uh, members of the community about what we're doing, what their options are, and, and those types of things. So um, that's definitely one thing that I've found as being the, the biggest challenge. And, and I think the climate reality um, training that I received really helped, uh, pers you know, um, uh, help me create that, uh, you know, uh, that presentation in a straightforward and, and professional manner and, and know exactly all the, all the speaking points that I have to touch on. Well, and we had discussed before the call that you were actually trained uh, during our training in Chicago in 2013. I guess, what was your experience like at the training and and what sort of skills or what sort of, you know, very useful knowledge have you taken away and and used in, in starting and, and really operating your business? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, kind of along along what Simone said, you know, not to be a, a salesperson um, at all. I, I genuinely uh, felt it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life and uh, met some uh, just great people there from uh, not all across the country, but all across the world. And um, it, and kind of the one, you know, of course, all, there's all the material and the content and everything that uh, that you receive as a as a climate reality leader. But kind of the one thing that I always remember that um, Al Gore said was just, you know, three very simple words: is just win the conversation. And and that's not just um, per se to kind of frame you know, climate discussions or anything related to sustainability and kind of a win or lose. Um, situation, but it's, um, you know, make sure that you become kind of post-partisan, you're kind of uh, beyond political and, and use stories that people can relate to to con convey your points. And that's helped me um, in my business because, you know, I, I just talk to people about, you know, what if, you know, that, that shirt you have on, of course, we all have to wear clothing, but um, in, instead of it, you know, being made from, you know, virgin cotton, what if it was made from recycled plastic bottles? And people say, well, you know, I'd probably wear the same thing, especially if it was about the same price. And then you kind of go into that conversation and you, you just kind of tell them the story. And, and all of a sudden you're, you're not, you're not talking politics. You're not even talking sustainability. You're, you're just talking about a shirt. And, and so you're um, in a sense, you know, kind of winning, winning the conversation in that regard. So I, I hope that kind of <laughs> wasn't too, uh, um, uh, what rambling, but that's what I always remember. Just win the conversation, you know. Make sure to, you know, talk open and honestly, and 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 share a story. And That's actually, great. just let me add, let me add to that because I think that I didn't say anything about that. But one of the things I learned is really how you connect with people on a personal level rather than try to convince them of the facts. And and I think that was a really important uh, an important part of of that winning the conversation that that there are, you know, there are very simple things uh, that we have in common, like we want our children to have uh, fresh air, to breathe fresh air and to have a, you know, to pass on a, a clean environment. And, and I think that those are some of the goals that, that cross, you know, that are completely bipartisan, so. Great. Well, Simone and Jason, thanks so much for, for joining us today. We have a few minutes here that we have, uh, so we can answer some of the questions coming in from from our listeners out there. Uh, one of the questions that has come in fairly frequently is, uh, is this webinar being recorded and will it be made available? And yes, it will. Uh, we hope by tomorrow we'll have that posted and we'll be sending out an email to all of you who had registered for, for the webinar. Uh, one question that's come in uh, from, from one of our listeners involves businesses, it was mentioned earlier um, in the webinar about businesses being really focused in the short term on generating profits and 
and how you can still do that and have a sustainable business. I was hoping that someone on the on the panel here uh, could talk a little bit more about that, what they've seen in, in terms of their own experience of, of being profitable, but also sustainable. Hi, it's Jamie here. I'm happy to take that one. So we, yeah, we launched um, Three Squares Inc. back in 2008 and have been on a steady growth trajectory ever since. And part of the reason why I decided two years ago to launch the second company, One Drop Interactive, is because I really felt that this industry is really, you know, sustainability, clean tech, environmental is still at a, at its na at a nascent stage, and where there's a lot of room for growth. So I know in my talk earlier I mentioned the the policy, the support from the policy sides, state and federal, but I also think that you know we do well, a, a good portion of our business is directly with other businesses, and I think if you just look at the the Fortune 1000 and the, the pa purchasing power that they have. Um, there is a, a study that comes out, I think every year done by Accenture, where they interview the CEOs of the Fortune 500 or Fortune 1000 about specifically about their reactions to sustainability and climate change. And if you look at the answers and how the answers have changed um, over the last five years and how the, the support from the CEO level is, is pretty tremendous, I think it shows that there's definitely a, a, a demand for all different types of businesses to, to grow and support both both big business and and government toward a, a, a low carbon future and so you know we we have, have we are a for profit business we are a corporation um, both three squares Inc and one drop interactive but we are we do have a mission that is very cause based and I think that's a question that we get quite often you know why didn't we form a nonprofit we formed we specifically formed a corporation because we wanted to be able to grow, to provide great jobs, to provide training opportunities, um, and to have and to have a, a large impact. And and um, that's what we're doing. Great. Well, can any of our, our panelists speak to the disconnect between consumer intent to purchase uh, sustainably and actual purchases? That's another question that a listener is asking. Well, this is Brian McCannon from ASPC. I, I'm, I'm happy to take a crack at it. I, I, you know, if I think that I hear the question is, if, if, if people have the, consumers have the intent to purchase uh, and, and there's a, a discrepancy between what they're actually going out and purchasing, um, you know, I think that there's a, a, a number of layers to it is that, you know, is there enough consumer information? You know, I think smarter brands, Will uh, you know are need are rising up to meet that consumer demand for for products that are done more sustainably, uh, and they're putting it right on their logo. They're talking about it. They are transparent about their processes, or they're transparent about the progress. I think you see even traditional brands moving that way. They're certainly buying up, uh, you know, kind of small startup brands uh, to add to their portfolio. Um, but there's also you know consumer habits that are hard to change. Uh, you know, even in my lifestyle, I, I want to do better all the time, but I can from time to time can be lazy um, and, and fall back into things that I, I know, well, I could have made a better choice there. Uh, so I, I think it's a pretty complex question, but I think, you know, their smart brands are getting ahead of the curve by uh, leveraging this uh, as part of their identity um, because that's you know, they see the consumer going there. And, and I think the future of, of the purchasing is going to be heading in that direction. And can I just add to that, that, um, uh, you know, we're not at Future Air, we're not, we're early stage, so we're not quite selling yet. But, um, but I took a look at Jason's site um, and at the Spotted Door. And I think if you can buy a gift uh, from something that's recycled, and it's it's uh, it's beautiful. Then why wouldn't you? You know, and I think that that is that's very very compelling. And, and I'll just um, thanks thanks for the situation. And I mean, I'll even tell you that you know I have trouble getting my own mother to buy something for my website, and uh, that <laughs> probably says something to how how much difficulty some of us have in, in getting folks that would that should use 
whatever your product or service is, and it's not going to cost them anything more or, or, or you know, be in, in noticeable impact to them. It's just that um, there's kind of a convenience factor there and an, aware, and an awareness factor. And so, um, you know, for example, for our, with our website, um, there never really was a store out there that was kind of the go-to um, location for recycled products. There's stuff for vintage, there's stuff for secondhand, there's stuff for handmade, um, but there's no kind of central part like that. And so, yeah, it is just kind of making sure that you stay front and center in, in folks' mind. And and to me, it's even mentioning to my mom every time I talk to her, hey, don't don't forget next time you go to buy something that maybe just peek at the site and see if, uh, you know, it's, it's on there. So anyway, but it's just thought I'd share that because, I mean, it, you, it's even just tough to get your own family members to support you sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're just about out of time, but we're getting a lot of questions about our upcoming Miami training. It's not too late to apply to that. Olena, tell us more about that. Great. Thanks, Ryan. I was seeing a few questions come in as well. Uh, so you do have just a little over a week to apply. We did extend our application deadline to September 4th. So you can go to climaterealitytraining.org to learn more, to see some of our speakers, um, to hear from climate reality leaders who will be there, as well as apply. So please get your applications in. They are reviewed on a rolling basis. There are also a lot of questions right now about where we're going in 2016. Uh, we're not sure yet. We're still working out the details. Uh, Mr. Gordon, our CEO, make those determinations um, based on your climate reality strategy. Uh, if you don't think you'll be able to attend Miami, but you really want to learn more, also go to climaterealitytraining.org. You can sign up for our listserv there, and we'll keep you updated with uh, as soon as we go public with 2016 training dates and locations. Thank you very much. And again, the recording of this webinar will be made available by tomorrow, we hope. And thank you for uh, thank you all to all of our panelists for participating. This is a, a very interesting discussion. We could have gone much longer on this topic. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, everyone.